questions. Question orale, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We now know why the Prime Minister did not fire his Minister of Public Safety of safe public safety, his minister who is misleading and incompetent. Here's why. Because the prime minister himself is the one who approved the transfer of Paul Bernardo to a minimum security prison with more freedoms and more comforts in that prison. The prime minister is in Ottawa today. So does he have the courage to stand up and explain to the victims of Paul Bernardo why he wanted to give more freedoms and comforts to that monster? The Honourable Government Leader in the House. Mr. Speaker, the crimes in question were despicable, unspeakable. There are no words to describe how awful it was. Everyone in Canada was affected by these crimes. The families were traumatized by these crimes. The Prime Minister well, first, Mr. Speaker, I would like to say that the Correctional Service of Canada is fully independent, and we cannot have political interference in our corrections. Why the Prime Minister refuses to fire his incompetent and misleading public safety minister, and it is that the Prime Minister himself was the one who accepted the transfer of Paul Bernardo from a maximum security prison to a medium security prison where he would have access to human interaction, more freedom and more comfort. His office knew three months beforehand and his cabinet has the power to direct the uh, correctional authorities to keep mass murderers in maximum security prisons. Will the Prime Minister show the courage to stand on his feet and explain to victims of Paul Bernardo why he wanted to give this monster more freedom and comfort? Yes. Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, the idea that anybody in this House um, would have any sympathy uh, for the monstrous acts that were committed is absolutely repugnant. Uh, the second thing that I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that it's unfortunate that the Leader of the Opposition mischaracterized uh, what happened. He knows very well that Correctional Services Canada makes those decisions independently. He knows very well as well, Mr. Speaker, that we have a system we're not supposed to interfere politically with that. And Mr. Speaker, it is true in March that, that staff were informed of the possibility. It wasn't until that possibility was confirmed that they informed the Prime Minister at the end of May. The Leader of the Opposition. Based on that account, the Prime Minister knew the day of the transfer, and his off office knew three months earlier. The government has in the past issued directives to correction services on what should be done with various classes of prisoners, like by forcing those with contraband into dry prison cells, for example. In other words, they do have the power to direct corrections on these issues. The Prime Minister and his office knew for three months. Given that he's here in Ottawa today, does he have the courage to explain his decision to let this monster go out of a maximum security penitentiary, yes or no? Opposition officer, uh, who I know cares as deeply about the gravity of those crimes and the impact on the families as I do. I know he cares as deeply about what we're going to do for Canadians on that. I also know that he knows the independent, uh, independence of our correctional services system. I know that he also knows that we're not supposed to interfere politically. And so I would ask him to work collaboratively with us to find a way where we don't politicize Correctional Services Canada and we work together to make sure that the families who are impacted in crimes of these nature are, are taken care of, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I look across at the Prime Minister's seat. I know that he is in Ottawa today, and if he had the courage, he would be standing to answer these questions directly. No, that's, that, I just want to remind the Honourable Members that we can't do indirectly what we do directly. So I'll let him continue. And I take the House Leader up on his challenge to work with us. We have a bill 
that would make sure every mass murderer stays in a maximum exactly. security right. penitentiary. Right. It's before the House. Will the government pass it with unanimous consent today? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. So first of all, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would say that I look directly at the leader of the official opposition for a reason. I look at him for a reason because when we're dealing with when we're dealing with something as serious and as 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 brutal as the crimes that occurred in an, in a community that was right next to mine, that I felt viscerally uh, that the conversation that we have has to be measured. It has to be based on cooperation, and frankly, Mr. Speaker, based on the underlying premise that every member cares equally and deeply about this, about two things, about the victims, absolutely, but also about not politicizing our correctional services system. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I take the, I take the House Leader at his word that he is equally horrified with this monster and that he wants to do something, but I take him at his word when he says he wants to work with us to reverse this transfer and put this monster back in a maximum security penitentiary. The good news is that he can do that today. The member, the Conservative member for Niagara Falls, who represents many of the family and friends of the victims, has a bill that would ensure that every single mass murderer stays in a maximum security penitentiary mm -hmm. forever. Will the government commit to passing it with unanimous consent and send Paul Bernardo back to maximum security penitentiary? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we are, in all instances, ready to have a conversation about how we don't politicize our correctional services, about how we ensure that we take care of victims and their families. And, Mr. Speaker, there is a review of the decision that was made by Correctional Services. It's going to be completed in two weeks. I would suggest that we take a look at that. And I would also suggest that when we're dealing with something as major as changing our correctional services system, that it deserves discussion, it deserves the ability for it to be examined by all parliamentarians and to make sure that we don't create unintended consequences, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, a commission of inquiry into Chinese interference must be established before the end of the session. Why? Because investigations take time, and we've already wasted too much time. If we want to reassure the public, we need to get to the bottom of the interference in the last elections before the next election. That is the only way to assure the public of the probity of the next federal election. So I appeal to my colleagues' statesmanship. Time is running out. Will they announce a public and independent commission of inquiry before the end of the session? The Honourable Public Safety Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm very encouraged by the exchanges between uh, my colleague, the Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs, and the Bloc Québécois and the NDP. I hope that conversations will occur with the Conservatives as well. This fight, the fight against foreign interference, is not a partisan one. We need to do this work together. That way, we can create new powers, we can add resources. This will help in the fight against foreign interference, and that's what's most important. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, at this point, my colleagues will have understood that the Bloc Québécois will not let this one go. The public's trust in democracy is at stake. The public is calling for a public and independent commission of inquiry. Its commissioner must be approved by this House. And the Commission will have to report on its work not in five years, not in two years, but in the next few months. It's a huge undertaking, Mr. Speaker. We know that. That's why we're working with the government. The government knows that it's a huge undertaking, too. We have our work cut out for us. So will the government announce this Commission? The Honourable Minister. First, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague for her teamwork. The option of a public choir inquiry is still an option on the table, as my colleague is currently negotiating with the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. What's most important is that we work together with Canadians in order to create new authorities to protect not only our democratic institutions, but Canadians themselves, too. Burnaby, the Minister of Security. The Public Safety Minister, the President of the Privy Council, the Foreign Minister of Foreign Af uh, Affairs, the Prime Minister, what do they all have in common? Well, apparently they are all unable to read their emails. It's becoming a dangerous trend. Is this government aware of the trauma that it is 
making the victims' families relive. They were victims of one of the worst killers in Canadian history. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, absolutely, these crimes were probably the worst in Canada, in Canada. They're incredibly serious. But it's also very important to note that our correctional service must be independent. We received information that there was a possibility that the individual in question might be transferred, but we only received that information after all the details had been confirmed. That's when the Prime Minister received the information, at the end, after. Now, Mr. The Honourable Member for New Westminster, After fiasco with this government, the level of disorganization and negligence from Liberal ministers is often appalling. After the Public Security Minister has failed to be informed of the transfer of one of the most brutal criminals in Canadian history, we now know that the Prime Minister's office was informed three months ago. They could have used that time to ensure the victims' families were warned. How does this keep happening on such serious files? Why are they showing such clear and Competence. When will they fix this? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as I stated, in March, there, there was uh, staff were informed of the possibility. There were still many details that were not certain. The possibility of a transfer. It wasn't until the end of May, once the details were confirmed, that the Prime Minister was briefed. And what I would say to the member opposite, who knows that correctional service is, in, is independent and that decisions must not be made with political interference, uh, is I would say to him that we have to have a conversation as a House about how we not interfere with correctional services in Canada, but also make sure that a transfer of this nature uh, doesn't occur. And that needs to be a mature conversation that doesn't involve a lot of politics, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, just when you think things can't get any worse with this Liberal government, the Prime Minister says, hold my beer. <laughs> For three months, because it's a game to this Prime Minister, that's what this is. For three months, the Public Safety Minister knew that child murderer and Scarborough rapist Paul Bernardo was moved, being moved from maximum to medium security prison and did nothing. Now, we know the Prime Minister also knew for three months and also did nothing. This isn't a game. Incompetence does not even begin to describe this leadership. Canadians deserve better, and these victims' families deserve better. So, will the Public Safety Minister... The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know the member from Peterborough well, uh, but I do know that uh, she's very sincere when she cares about these cases, as she would know uh, that the Prime Minister uh, would be deeply impacted as a father and as a Canadian by the horror of these crimes. Any assertion to the opposite, Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, is, is just frankly not constructive to the debate that we need to have. I've said the Correctional Services operates independently, that it can't be interfered with politically. I would also say that we have to be very careful when dealing with the victims of crime that we don't politicize that or attempt to use it in a way other than to ask how we stop the... The Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. If the Prime Minister is so upset, why won't he stand up and answer this question? and talk to the victims' families. If they care so much, then do it. I've said this before. The buck stops with the minister. Stop the blame game. This is people's lives. You are in the government. The prime minister, there's no one below that. Again, there is duty here. Either fire the, the public safety minister or resign. That's it. Those are the options. I just want to remind the honourable members to place their questions through the chair, not speak directly to each other. The honourable uh, government house leader. The duty that each of us share as honourable members in this chamber uh, is on behalf of the people that we are fortunate enough to represent, uh, to attempt to the best of our ability to keep them safe, 
to make sure when they are harmed that we do everything in our power to restore them uh, and to make sure yes mr. speaker that we have a correction system that is interfere that is free from for that free from interference and why do we say that mr. speaker because we have one of the best correctional services systems in the world and if we're talking about the rightful outrage that we all have in this circumstance we have to temper it in a mature conversation of how to balance those two priorities mr. speaker the Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, does this Minister of Public Safety expect us to believe that for three months his office withheld information from him about the most notorious murderer and serial rapist in Canada, that he had been transferred to a medium security prison? It's clear. The minister likely knew about the transfer in March and did nothing. The entire government likely knew and did nothing about it, including the prime minister's office. When will the prime minister finally admit that he has lost total control of his cabinet and ask this minister to resign? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by taking a moment uh, to express my support for the families of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French, who have no doubt been traumatized time and time again uh, by the decision that was taken under Correctional Services Canada. That's why when I found out on May 30th, I took immediate action to reach out to the Commissioner to express those concerns. And I want to work with all members to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The directions that I have put into motion will ensure that I'm directly briefed and most importantly, that victims are given advance notice before these decisions are taken in the future. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is in town, so why won't he stand and answer these questions? The Minister has misled Canadians before. He has said at least 11 times that law enforcement requested the Emergencies Act. That was false. He said that Bill C-21 wasn't going to ban guns used by hunters and farmers. That was false. He said that Chinese police stations in Canada had been shut down. That was false. Canadians have lost confidence in this minister. So will he do the honourable thing and just resign? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, on each and every one of those priorities, this government has defended public safety in the interest of all Canadians. When it comes to fighting against gun violence, we are banning AR-15s. The Conservatives want to make them legal again. When last year we faced an unprecedented national emergency, we invoked the Emergencies Act, a decision which was validated by Judge Rue and Judge Rouleau independently. What did the Conservatives do, Mr. Speaker? I, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt. It's starting to, the, the, the noise level is starting to build up again, and we're having a hard time hearing the answer. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk asked a question. She would like to hear the answer. I mean, if there's people yelling behind her, it's very difficult for her to hear. So I'm going to ask the Honourable Member, maybe start off about 15 minutes from the end, or 15 seconds. No, no. Do not take 15 minutes. 15 seconds from the end. If I could have everybody take a deep breath. And now we'll listen to the minister for about 15 seconds, please. Mr. Speaker, I think all members will be relieved to hear I won't need 15 minutes. But what I will say <laughs> is when it comes to fighting gun violence, we're banning AR-15s. The Conservatives want to make them legal again. When it came to the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act, Mr. Speaker, we defended that decision to restore public safety. Conservatives were doubling down, encouraging illegal protesters to stay in the region they should have left. We'll always Honorable député. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins, Lévy. Hello, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is in Ottawa, but it's interesting because he's not here to answer questions. On the Bernardo case, last week, the Minister of Public Safety feigned surprise about the criminal's transfer from a maximum security prison to a medium security facility. But he had known about it for three months, Mr. Speaker. In fact, even the Prime Minister's office knew about it. No one did anything. This is liberal incompetence at its finest. When will the Minister resign, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious situation. We are all concerned by this tragedy. But, Mr. Speaker, it is important to remember that our corrections system is independent. It is essential that the decision to transfer an offender is 
a decision made by Correctional Service of Canada. Now, I know that there is a lot of emotion right now. I feel the same, but we need to... The Honourable Member for Belchas, Les Echemel Lévy. Mr. Speaker, he knew that this dangerous criminal would benefit from a less severe prison. He must also have known that this decision would outrage and worry the victim's families. The Minister of Public Safety does not have a very good track record, what with dubious decisions, backtracking, and statements that are not tr the truth. So if this government has a leader who sees things clearly and is leading in the best interests of Canadians and victims, let him stand up and throw this minister out. The Honourable Public Safety Minister. Mr. Speaker, our thoughts are with the families and close ones of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. On May 30th, when I was informed, I took necessary action and now there is an independent review of what transpired. It is ongoing. Yesterday, I published new directives for correctional services to ensure that families of victims will be informed in situations like this in the future. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lemitis Matan, Madapedia. Mr. Speaker, don't ask the Minister of Public Safety about Paul Bernardo's transfer. He doesn't know a thing about it even though his employees knew. Don't ask the Prime Minister either. He doesn't know a thing about it either, even though his staff knew about it. Just like the Prime Minister didn't know about Beijing's threats against a Conservative politician, even though his employees knew about it. For that matter, don't talk to the Minister of Emergency Preparedness either about the threats. He didn't know a thing about it either, even though his staff knew about it. If you want to talk to someone in the know, talk to an employee. So should employees become ministers? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I take this issue very seriously. That's why, when I was informed on May 30th, I took necessary action. I had a frank conversation with the Correctional Services Commissioner, and that's why I made new directives. There will be directives to protect victims' rights. There need to be directives to clarify that. We will work together with all members of this House to protect victims' rights and to make Sensible decisions. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamitis, Matan, Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, at this point, it's a pattern. Ministers are constantly telling us that they're not aware of briefing notes that the senior civil service confirms were sent directly to those ministers' staff. Mr. Speaker, we can take them at their word that their staff did not see fit to inform them once, maybe twice. But there comes a point where it's the political equivalent of saying, my dog ate my homework. And these ministers are losing their homework quite often. So when are we going to see some real accountability from them? Because we're starting to worry about the health of the dogs eating all that homework. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, in the current situation, as I have already explained, Staff did receive the information that it was possible, there, that it was a possibility. They didn't receive any concrete details or a decision. And as I've already explained, the decision to transfer an incarcerated individual is an independent choice made by Correctional Services. When it was concluded, when it was decided on, then, at the end of May, the Prime Minister was informed. That's the truth, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Levy, Avignon, Lamitis, Matan, Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, just because we're laughing doesn't mean it's funny. Ministers have a responsibility to inform themselves and then inform their constituents. Just this spring, in fact, if we had relied on the word of ministers rather than on the reports in the media, three members of this House would still be facing threats from China without knowing it. Diplomat Zhao Wei would still be in office. Ten or so constituencies would still be subject to Chinese interference. This is what would have happened without the media if we had relied on ministerial accountability. When will they assume their ministerial responsibilities? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the responsibilities are to identify challenges and then correct course. That's what we did when we issued the directives to CSIS. We also issued new directives to Correctional Service Canada 
in order to correct the situation effectively and efficiently in order to ensure protection of victims' rights and the safety of all. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government put convicted murderer, kidnapper and child rapist Paul Bernardo into a medium security prison. Meanwhile, if the PM is in Ottawa, why won't he stand up and answer the beloved questions? Exactly. In 2013, the Conservative government took responsibility when we were faced with exactly the same issue. Paul Bernardo was to be transferred to medium security prison and the Conservative government of the day said no. The public safety minister, including the prime minister himself, have said yes. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister resign for granting leniency to the most notorious child murderer? The Honourable <laughs> Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, as I've said many times, uh, as every Canadian knows, uh, the crimes that are in question are amongst the most grievous this country has ever faced. There is not a person who is not impacted by them, who is in this House. I trust that the member cares uh, deeply about it, as do I. But the assertion uh, that this is a decision of the government is false, and it in fact is dangerous. The decision to transfer inmates is a decision of Correctional Services Canada. The independence of our Correctional Service has been a foundation of our country for a very long time. Having a mature conversation about how we respect that and respect victims is what I think Canadians expect. I just want to point out to the Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies, we've heard your comment. You don't have to repeat it over and over again. It's just not the right, not the right time. Please talk to your whip about getting a speaking role. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. I think it's worth noting that the government has the authority to introduce legislation, such as bills the Conservative Party has just put forward to ensure that offenders like Paul Bernardo, one of Canada's worst serial rapists, stay in maximum security. That's their job. The Prime Minister's office, the Prime Minister knew about this for three months. He has a litany of highly paid staff to tell him about these things. It's preposterous to think that he didn't. His public itinerary today says that he's in the National Capital Region. How come he hasn't informed this House of the Public Safety Minister's resignation? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the member across has made it clear, uh, not just now, uh, but for a long time, uh, uh, her desire uh, for her party to be successful and for their party to form uh, this side. They have to do that through an election, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but I will say that on this issue, that the decision that was made is independent and that if we want to have a conversation about Correctional Services Canada's decisions, that's exactly what we're doing. There is a review taking place. It concludes in two weeks. We have asked them to review this decision, and I think that understanding that these decisions are done independently is important. It's been an important foundation of corrections in this country. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. This government has had eight years to consult, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a leap of logic to understand that re-victimizing families by these of these serial rapists by allowing their transfers out of maximum security prison is something that the government should have worked to avoid, like they failed with with the Terry Lynn McClintock case. This public safety minister, and I mean, you, if, the, if, the, if, if the member looks behind in his, in his caucus, he'll see his caucus cringing. He has the worst record of failure in this government, outside of the prime minister. How come the prime minister, who's in the national capital region today, has not informed this? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think we should choose what we talk about. If we want to talk about... Uh, the circumstances that are involved in these horrific crimes and how we can responsibly deal with a correction system that's one of the best and most envied in the world. I'm going to have to stop that, uh, the Honourable Minister. The Honourable, the Honourable uh, Government House Leader from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When we talk about these issues, I would suggest that they require enormous sensitivity. And I am concerned that in every question uh, that, they're, that they're peppering it 
with uh, partisan commentary uh, and trying to extract political advantage from this situation, Mr. Speaker. I have attempted, as I've talked about this, to talk about the responsibility. We have one of the greatest correctional services systems in the world. It is mired all over the world, and one of its principal tenets is to not interfere with it politically. And so we all rightfully feel outrage about this transfer. We have great emotion about the crimes that occurred, but we need to deal with that emotion responsibly, Mr. Speaker, and make... The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. International students who were victims of unscrupulous immigration agents should not be punished. They've invested everything they have to study in Canada. They've contributed to the economic, cultural and social fabric of our community. Halting the deportation and removal orders is a good first step. The Minister said he's working on a long-term solution. However, what the student needs is a permanent residency status. Will the minister I'll follow up to ensure that an alternate permanent residence pathway is made available to the victims of fraud. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for her question and her advocacy, along with members of this House that come from all parties that are represented in the House of Commons, to find a solution for innocent victims who were taken advantage of by fraudsters who allowed them to enter Canada on the basis of fraudulent letters of admission. Yesterday, we announced a new path forward, including a task force that would give an opportunity for students to demonstrate that they were not complicit in fraud, but in fact were victims of fraud. They will be given temporary uh, status in Canada to allow them to complete their studies or to continue to work. We've also advanced new measures to ensure they could apply for permanent residency or to remain in Canada without prejudice. That is the right path forward to punish per The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. The London Food Bank is seeing its highest turnout ever. People just can't afford the cost of food right now, and major grocers are using inflation as a cover to jack up prices. This government is choosing pr to protect the profits and greed of major grocers while Canadians' bills skyrocket. The multipartisan committee released a report stressing how a windfall tax will incentivize large grocers to keep prices low. So will this government implement this windfall tax immediately so Canadians can stop going to food banks and actually afford their groceries? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we agree with the member and we know that Canadians are paying far too much for their groceries right now. This is why uh, not long ago the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry wrote to the Competition Bureau to make sure that the Bureau is using all of the tools it has as it, at its disposal to keep prices down and to prevent prevent businesses from taking advantage of the high prices and profiting off, off of Canadians. We've also asked the Bureau to look immediately into these matters and we'll continue to work to make life more affordable for Canadians in all matters. Mr. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Speaker, around the world, we are seeing the rights of 2S LGBTQIA plus people being restricted, even within our own borders. We are seeing extremist groups callously using trans, innocent trans and non-binary children as political targets. Mm -hmm. The Minister of Labour recently represented Canada, the UN International Labour Organization in Geneva, where he raised this issue. <clears throat> Would the Minister share with the House what he said to this international forum. The Honourable Minister. A few days ago, I stood before nations uh, who have attempted to roll back to SLGBTQI plus rights, and I reminded them that as a gay and married man, I would be jailed or even condemned to death if I happened to have been born in our countries. Nations make progress and they achieve rights in their own time, in their own way, as was the case with Canada, and we respect that. But once those rights are achieved, once they are named, we will not stand by and see them swept under the carpet or put back in the closet or taken away. Not here, not there, not anywhere. Thank you. Mr. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. You know, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and his cabinet have never absolutely never taken responsibility for their many acts of bad faith. For example, as Minister for Public Safety alone has misled this House no fewer than seven times. He even misled a judge by backdating documents. That alone should have led to his dismissal, but he's still with us today. The Liberals have also never shown any sensitivity for the victims of Paul Bernardo. The Prime Minister is in Ottawa. Can he finally tell us that he will dis dismiss the Minister for Public Safety? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, it is absolutely false. That question is absolutely false. I called 
representatives of the families of victims to explain our government solidarity, to express our full support. And now we will work with correctional services to avoid such examples in the future. We have to notify victims before making this kind of decision. That is what we will do in the future. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg Saint Charles. Correctional Services Canada informed the Prime Minister's office three months ago that Paul Bernardo was going to be transferred to a medium security facility. Did anyone at the PMO, did anyone decide that perhaps it might be a good idea to communicate with families? Because it seems that no one else thought of the victim families when it should be the very first thing to do. The Minister said he did it two weeks ago. Why did the Prime Minister not do it three months ago? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect to my honourable colleague, he does not understand current statutes here in Canada, and these are questions that we have to address. We are ready to work together with all members in this House, but in the meantime, I will be emitting new directives for correctional services to make sure that important things will be done. I will be briefed directly and that uh, correctional services notify victims when such decisions are made in the future. For Wellington, Halton Hills. No. Mr. Speaker, an unsealed Justice Department indictment in U.S. court revealed that a Canadian in Vancouver was coerced back to the PRC. It's been eight months since the first reports about Beijing's illegal police service stations. Beijing brazenly admitted to five of these stations and another two have been identified. These stations are being used to coerce people back to the PRC. The minister has indicated that these stations were shut down, but they haven't been. When will they be? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with great respect for my colleague, he needs to listen carefully to the RCMP, who have consistently updated Canadians that they are taking action in regards to foreign interference that are in association with these so-called police stations. If the Conservatives are serious about fighting foreign interference, they will stop with the partisan attacks, they will support the government's agenda to tackle this issue, and do so in a way that is unifying, because we must protect our democratic institutions and, most importantly, Canadians from this phenomenon. The Honourable Member for Wellington Hills. Mr. Speaker, that same indictment also re revealed that in New York City last summer, PRC agents tried to coerce someone in New York City to come to Toronto for more intensive interrogations. The implication is that Beijing is comfortable using Canada as its foreign interference playground. Wow. Maybe that's because two months ago, those same PRC agents were arrested. Yet here no north of the border, nothing. No arrests, no new legislation. That's when right. will the Prime Minister replace this minister with someone who will get the job done? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we are getting the job done by adding new authorities for our national security establishment, by adding $49 million for the RCMP to protect Canadians from foreign interference, by being on the cusp of introducing new, a new foreign agent registry. I, I, I'm, going to have to, I'm going to have to break for a second. We're starting to see the volume go up again, and it's, we're hearing individual voices. It's, it's just getting a little bit out of hand, so we're going to take a deep breath and pause a bit. And now we'll ask the Honourable Minister to start from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, we are getting the job done by making sure that we equip our national security establishment with the tools that they need to fight foreign interference, with additional resources for the RCMP, which we put into the budget, and by raising the bar on transparency through the creation of NCCOP and NCIRA, and by continuing to engage Canadians on this. That's what we're doing. What Conservatives are doing are continuing on with an agenda that focuses on partisan attacks. They should stop that and do the work with all members in this chamber so that we can fight against foreign interference and protect our democratic institutions. The Honourable Deputy de Drummond. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, 1,300 people found that they were going to lose their jobs yesterday at Bell Media. Six radio stations are closing their doors. When even a giant like Bell can no longer protect its media and newsrooms, these are serious times. The entire news in industry is under threat, as are the people who make it. The Bloc are quite proud to have contributed to C11 and C18 essential bills. But I'm sure the minister agrees that even more needs to be done. In light of these job losses, what is the minister proposing to better protect the diversity of information? 
The Honourable Minister for Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, my thoughts are for all those who lost their jobs. It's always worrying when there are job cuts and when radios are closed, when journalists lose their job. And that is why we have been here from the very beginning. We have worked with the Bloc Québécois, we have worked with the NDP to put forward C11 and C18, but the Conservatives have done everything to delay it, everything to try and delay it. Do they now understand that their actions have consequences? The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, this wave of job costs at Bell proves that there is, a, there is still pessimism about the future, even among the biggest telecommunications giants. So imagine what is the case for smaller entities. We have to ask ourselves whether the current federal programs and the royalties from C18 will really ensure the survival of our news media. The Bleu Québécois is therefore proposing the creation of a dedicated fund separate from current programs, dedicated entirely to protecting news media and newsrooms. I think that that's where we are, Mr. Speaker. What does the minister think about this? Is he ready to work with us to develop such a fund? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the government is always open to new solutions. We'll always examine what we can do better. We created a tax break for media. The Conservatives were against. When we had measures for our various regions, the Conservatives were against. And when we put C18 forwards, the, the Conservatives once again, once again were against. Do they not understand that their actions have real consequences, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. To demonstrate once again his admiration for the basic dictatorship of the Beijing regime, the Prime Minister wanted to contribute himself to its expansion in 2016 by announcing an amount of $250 million to the Asian Investment Bank. We warned the Prime Minister. We saw that the, there was a trap. The Conservatives saw the trap. One of the bank's leaders has now stated that it was in fact run by the Communist Party in Beijing. Canadians should not have to pay a quarter of a billion dollars for the expansion of the Beijing regime. When will the Prime Minister get our money back? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, like the Deputy Prime Minister stated yesterday, in answer to this question, the Government of Canada will immediately put an end to all of its activities with the Asian Investment Bank. And she asked the, Minister, the Department of Finance to carry out an investigation in Canada's participation with the AIB. We also talk on the matter with our allies. The investigation announced yesterday has to be done as rapidly as possible. No result has been excluded as of yet. Capel. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal appointed board member on the Asian Infrastructure Bank just resigned, calling it a cesspool and saying that it was controlled by, quote, the Communist Party crowd who operate like a secret police. Who could have seen this coming? <laughs> who could have predicted that a bank structured to give Beijing effective control would use the bank to expand the power and influence of the communist regime in Beijing? Who could have possibly seen that coming? Right. Conservatives, that's who. We warned these Liberals not to put tax dollars into the scam of a bank. So when are they getting our money back? Yes. Yes. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. The Prime Minister said yesterday, and as I said in this House yesterday, related to this matter, the Government of Canada will immediately halt all government-led activity at the bank, and she has instructed the Department of Finance to lead an immediate review of the allegations raised and of Canada's involvement at the AIIB. The Canadian Government will also be discussing this issue with our allies and partners who are members of the bank. The review is to be undertaken expeditiously. No outcome is being ruled out following this investigation. For Regina Capel. Mr. Speaker, nobody likes and I told you so. Except for everyone who told you so. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just Conservatives, it was our major security partners like Japan and the United States and foreign affairs experts who all said the same thing. That the communist regime would use the bank to bully developing countries and expand its power and influence. This bank built railways and ports with taxpayers' dollars while Canadians here at home are struggling just to pay the bills. So now that the con has been exposed, Will they do the right thing and get Canadians their tax dollars back? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, same question, same answer as we said yesterday in this House. And as the Deputy Prime Minister has been very clear, we have ceased all government-led activities with the AIIB. We have, invest, we have asked finance to conduct an immediate investigation into the activities of the bank. This investigation is to be taken, undertaken expeditiously, and no outcome is being ruled out from this outcome. 
The Honourable Member for Calgary Skyview. Mr. Speaker, countries around the world are racing to seize the extraordinary economic opportunities that come with building a low carbon economy, investing in clean energy, and scaling new technologies. We must ensure that Canadian workers are equipped with the right skills in the right place at the right time. Can the Minister of Natural Resources please share how this government is helping workers capitalize on this opportunity and ensure Canada is a leader in all things energy. Yay. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for his uh, incredible advocacy on these issues. The global race to build... <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question and for his advocacy on these important issues. The global race to build a low-carbon economy is the greatest job creation opportunity of our time. We can either work to seize this opportunity or we can put our heads in the sand and let it pass us by. Having a serious plan to address climate change is required for a serious plan for Canada's economic future. Today, with the, sta uh, the tabling of the Sustainable Jobs Act, our government is choosing to seize the moment. This act will create and maintain jobs in communities across Canada by helping workers gain the necessary skills and training to fill the jobs of a low-carbon world. We are building an economy where Canadian workers and businesses will thrive. Before, before going to the next question, I just want to remind the Honourable Member for Calgary Midland, if it's not polite to try to scream over the voice of someone else. The Honourable Member for King Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, the cost of this Prime Minister's Liberal government is driving up the cost of living. The more he spends, the more things cost. According to the latest National Rent Report, average rent for a two-bedroom apartment in King Vaughan is $2,650, oh, the fifth highest in the GTA. Canadians are sick and tired of this government trying to convince them that nev they've never had it so good. When will this Liberal Prime Minister show some compassion and stop the out-of-control inflationary spending so Canadians can stay in their homes? The Honourable Minister for Families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What Canadians are sick and tired of is the Conservative hypocrisy that they care about affordability for <laughs> Canadians. Right now in this House, they are holding up Bill C-35, an act on Shame. early learning Shame. and child care. There are 19 minutes left in debate to get this bill passed through this House and to the Senate. They keep saying they care about affordable child care, Mr. Speaker, but all they have done is play games, partisan games, to hold it up. When will they finally be honest with Canadians and tell them they don't care about it instead of playing these silly games? The Honourable Member for Coast of Bay Central Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, fuel companies throughout Atlantic Canada have sent letters to their customers telling them on July 1st, propane is going up 12 cents a litre, gasoline 17 cents a litre, home heating and, and diesel 20 cents a litre. Folks from Kentville, Antigonish, Sydney, St. John, Fredericton, Edmonston, Cornerbrook, Clarenville, CBS, Lab City, and all over PEI have sent me a copy of their letter. Mr. Speaker, will the evil genius who invented carbon tax two, number two, please stand up and tell us why he's persecuting Atlantic Canadians? I would like to remind the Honourable Member that the Conservative Party of Canada campaign on a plan form to implement a clean fuel standard, except that they're all words, we're all action, Mr. Speaker. We have worked with companies across the country to ensure that we can have in Canada lower carbon emitting fuels. We're creating investments across the country in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Quebec, Newfoundland of more than $2 billion in the last year alone in clean fuel, Mr. Speaker. We will continue ensuring that we can create good jobs, have a good economy, and tackle climate change. The Honourable Member for Coast of Bay's Mr. Central Speaker, Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, what a pile of baloney. Canadians know that all they've done is destroy jobs in Canada. Yeah. The Prime Minister's childhood friend, and he believes the same thing, Premier Fury says that when he asked the federal 
Federal Minister what impact carbon tax two would have. Uh, he admitted that it won't be zero. No, it won't be zero. It'll be $850 a year per household in Atlantic Canada. Will these Liberals finally admit that carbon tax isn't working, stop persecuting the people who elected them, and end carbon tax? The Honourable Minister for Northern Development. Speaker, you know, I really find it quite rich when I listen to our colleagues on the other side of the House. I'd like to give you a little history lesson, especially from my part of the country. The first thing we did was we reopened the Veterans Affairs Office that the other government closed. The other thing we did, as a coastal community, they closed down the Coast Guard in search and rescue. We built a new facility. We opened it. Then we raised taxes on the wealthiest. We lowered it on the middle class. We lowered taxes for small businesses twice. We've been there to help people through the pandemic. We're there now helping with dental care, with child care benefits, and helping people turn off coal. The Honourable Member for St. John's East. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that raising awareness is one of the most effective ways to combat elder abuse. With today, June 15th, marking World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, could the Minister of Seniors provide an update to the House on the steps being taken by this government to increase awareness and prevention in the mistreatment of senior citizens of Canada? The Honourable Minister for Seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from St. John's East for her very important question. Mr. Speaker, any form of elder abuse is a despicable crime, and we take it very seriously. And, Mr. Speaker, our government is taking action by supporting over 600 community organizations that help seniors recognize and identify fraud and abuse. Mr. Speaker, by finalizing a definition of elder abuse, by establishing new offenses and penalties in the criminal code related to elder abuse, by investing in better data collection, and to ensure that tragedies like the ones that we saw in the long-term care, so, they ne so that they never happen again, we welcome the national long-term care standards and are working towards delivering a safe long-term care act. Thank you, Mr. Right. The Honourable Member for Cowichan Malahat Langford. Mr. Speaker, the Pachidot First Nation in my riding doesn't have a school for kids from grades 6 to 12. Every day, children as young as 11 have to bus 75 kilometers each way between home and school on a windy and narrow highway. That's three hours a day. Chief Jones came all the way to Ottawa to plead with Indigenous Services and Infrastructure Canada to help. Will the minister honour reconciliation and start working with the Pachidot to get this community the school they desperately need? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, since this government has, uh, was elected, we have worked tirelessly to close the gaping infrastructure gap that the pre previous Conservative That's government right. left. In fact, they underinvested in Indigenous children. They underinvested in Indigenous infrastructure. They did nothing about boil water advisories, Mr. Speaker, for a decade, which left a massive gap of infrastructure across the country, including children's schools. Our government has reversed that trend, Mr. Speaker, and of course, I will work tirelessly to make sure that every community has a school that children can be proud of and safe to learn in. The Honourable Member for Spadina Fort York. Mr. Speaker, on June 10th, Canada sees a Russian aircraft at Pearson Airport. Global Affairs Canada said it's working with Ukraine on, quote, options to redistribute this asset to compensate victims of human rights abuses, end quote. Mr. Speaker, why then is the government fighting the families of victims of flight PS752 from using an Ontario Superior Court ruling, allowing them to seize assets and obtain compensation from Iran? Why is our government protecting a ruthless regime and its murdering IRGC terrorists? Why are they standing with terrorists instead of grieving Canadian families? Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is an important question, when, and it gives me the opportunity to talk about two things. First, what we're doing to make sure that the Russian regime is held accountable. Canada is the first country in the world able now to seize and forfeit important assets of the Russian regime. Here, here. And indeed, we've seen the Antonov plane that has been stranded 
at the Pearson Airport. When it comes to Iran, we will continue to make sure that the regime itself is held accountable. We've sanctioned the RGC, we've sanctioned also key leaders, and we'll make sure that the families of the PS752, with which I've had numerous contacts and numerous meetings, will make sure that they are compensated and well supported. Thank you. Excellent. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for question period today. We have a point of order for the Honourable Member from Niagara, for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Speaker. If you seek it, I believe that you will find unanimous consent for the following motion. That notwithstanding.